Since the start of the new season, women's football has soared to success and scenes like this are becoming ever more regular for fans of the game. But while some big clubs thrive, many are still playing catch up from 100 years ago when the FA banned women's football and changed the course of history. The council feel impelled to express their strong opinion that the game of football is quite unsuitable for females and ought not to be encouraged. The council requests the clubs belonging to the association refuse the use of their club grounds for such matches. Back in the 1920s, women's football was arguably the most popular sport in the UK and attracting crowds of 20 to 30,000 was a regular occurrence. But when the FA imposed the 50-year ban on the women's game, it changed the attitude towards it forever. However, with back-to-back -back World Cups proving a success, club football is finally reaping the rewards of fan engagement. But beyond the top tier, there's still a long way to go. I'm travelling along the south coast of the small town of Lewis to spend the day with Katie Rood. Although still doing part-time work for her club in schools, the Lewis FC forward is one of the lucky players among the championship who gets to focus more on her footballing career than others. So I'm doing a podcast with Tom Hussey, I think, um, since 71 blog? I've heard of it, yeah. Do you know them? Yeah, yeah they're on Twitter and stuff, they're quite active. Second training of the year. It's a Sunday though, I'm not sure quite what we'll do. Should be good. Katie and I spent some time discussing the current discrepancies between the top tier and second tier in particular and how the FA should be working to close the gap. I think the big ones are like the resources, yeah. the finances, um, the facilities. I think a big one for to enable the players in the WSL and the championship to be better would be like just having the, the finances to be able to have the time to recover properly. You know, we're, we're especially the midweek games that we've been playing in the um, in the cup against WSL1 teams and it's like okay we're playing we're getting back at 1am most people are up at 8 going to work the next day you know whereas <laughs> the other teams they get a sleep in they can they come in they recover you know it's like it's a totally different ball game for a lot of players and I think it's a lot of it is down to resource management and like what's available for us. The frustrating thing that I can't comprehend coming from WSL1 was um, we straight away, you know, you get people coming from um, from the FA to come and talk to us and the big one was like um, the Players Association. So you, you pay a couple hundred quid, you become a member, you get access to so many things, you know, like um, career advice, you get um, medical facilities if you get injured, you get a, um, a discount off boots and things like this and it's like these are all things that are great but most of the WSL1 teams have that already mm. within their club and that, that would be something that would be so beneficial for the players in our league but we don't have access to it so that would be my big query to the FA is like well 
yeah, something like that, surely you'd want more players having a membership in the PFA. We're all striving to be professional. Um, yeah, and that little bit of investment back in us would help us grow significantly, I think. I travelled to Wembley to talk to Lauren O'Sullivan at the FA, wanting to get a better understanding of how they're supporting clubs beyond the top tier. In terms of um, medical insurance, we are looking at providing support to the clubs financially um, for, for coming seasons. And we'll also be working with other uh, stakeholders across the game, so PFA and the clubs, um, to, to ensure that players have, have got protection. Um, you know, it's really important to us. I was at a meeting um, earlier on in the week, looking at uh, the calendar planning for the um, for future season, and absolutely paramount to our decision making is around you know being player centred. That is that is absolutely part of our value set. So, um, yeah, when it comes to development, whether that's rules, whether it's calendar, um, whether it's you know, looking at player contracts, absolutely we try and take a player centred approach to, to decision making and, and development. One thing that has become clear through the making of this documentary is that women's football simply cannot survive by just investing in the big clubs. It has to nurture the roots of the game in order for it to continue its growth. We get kind of caught up on in like investing in the big clubs or like the top tier whereas I think if you um, especially with the minimal investment in women's football instead of investing in like the top 10 big clubs if you spread that out between the grassroots clubs or the clubs that are coming up through the ranks i think that would have a much bigger difference than um yeah focusing on the top ones